So, as I said, we're going to be looking at these two topics, jihad. Now, last time, um, I wanted to conclude with looking at jihad, but we ran out of time. So, um, I have an announcement to make. Um, what I'd like to do is go one more week. So, I don't know if any of you, if all of you can do that. Um, I have no problem with that, so we're going to add another week because of this issue here and some of the the things that I want to tackle, um, it's not sufficient, uh, the amount of time. So we're going to, this, this whole course will be seven weeks, okay? So I really just don't want to rush through things. I would rather, you know, look at them and be able to explain them and perhaps even have uh, questions and answers. And as I said to you before, um, any questions, write them down, write them down. And if we either, we get to them at the end of the class or you can also just give it to me and I can answer you later or send me an email. Or whatever okay so we're gonna look at this today and then we're also gonna look at after jihad we're gonna look at is answering Islamic objections Th this is one of the most vital most important things this is where we're really gonna start getting into apologetics because as a Christian not only with a Muslim but with anybody I should be able to know what I believe and why I believe it and I should be able to explain my faith because God has called us to know and, and to believe, okay? So we're going to look at those things. It's really exciting. Now, we're all very familiar with jihad, okay? This is holy war in Islam. But before we look at that, I would like to look at what we as Christians know and what the Bible teaches us, okay? As Christians following the Word of God, what did Jesus teach? And what does the New Testament te teach? Okay, I find this very interesting because especially when you are in a, in a discussion with a Muslim, or you're going to be hearing if you go on YouTube and you go on the internet and, and online and you see all, th all sorts of things that people will say. A lot of Muslims, of course, the most popular thing that Muslims will say is, well, no. Islam is a religion of peace. It never teaches to kill and to fight. And on and on and on they go. And we've, we've all heard it. But first of all, before we go to jihad, let's look at what do I believe and what does the Bible teach me, number one, and what does Jesus, who is the commander-in-chief of our faith, teach us? Because when all is said and done, guys, it comes down to two people. It comes down to Jesus Christ and it comes down to Muhammad. And that's, that's really, in a nutshell, what I want you to know. Because there are so many things to get you distracted at this and that history, what people do and Christians do and Muslims do. And it's easy to get lost in all of that. But really, it comes down to those two figures. But first of all, what did Jesus teach about fighting in the name of God? Well, turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Verses 52 and 53. Now, I want you to write these down because they're not in your notes. So, as Christians, we follow the Bible. What did Jesus teach and what does the New Testament teach? So, it's really interesting because I was preparing my, my class and this morning I was actually just having my devotions. But I just love how the Lord is because He works in such natural ways. And the Lord met me today in my devotions because I was reading from, I'm going to go over the accounts of Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection this week. And I would encourage anyone to do that. So today I did Matthew and tomorrow Mark and then Luke and John. Well, lo and behold, look at what Jesus said. Yes, Matthew 26, uh, verse 52. Verse 52. So here we go, they come to the Garden of Gethsemane and they come to arrest Jesus. We all are familiar with it. Well, look at the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the commander-in-chief of our faith. What does he say? Jesus said to him, okay, now this was, remember, it speaks of a man who came and took out a sword and cut off the priest here. We know later on that it was Peter, okay. Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? 
How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? There's a whole lot of stuff there that you can just meditate on and think about and cause you to, as we study jihad, to cause you to compare and look at the teachings of Muhammad. But look at the words of Jesus. First of all, he doesn't encourage him to fight. He discourages him. He says, no, put your sword in its place. For everyone who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And then Jesus furthermore says, I could ask for legions of angels to deliver me, but I choose not to. So Jesus voluntarily goes to the cross. Okay, next verse, John 18. So this is Jesus in front of the soldiers coming to attack him, coming to take him, arrest him. And then John 18. Here is Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate. And this is actually one of my favorite verses when I think about this issue, when I think of jihad. And I always, the Lord reminds me of this verse. I love this verse. John 18, 36. Now I'm going to back up here to verse 35. Pilate answered and said to Jesus, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Now, stop. If Jesus says, My kingdom, who has a kingdom? A king. Okay, so Jesus is implying that he is a king. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. So he's saying, If it were, then my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And then Pilate said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So these two verses right here give us an understanding. It builds a teaching of what did Jesus teach on violence? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, so I have a heavenly kingdom. And he taught me that I am not to fight, but that I am allowed God to take care of me and to defend me. But Jesus clearly, he did not teach his disciples. He did not lead them into war. It's very clear. It's very clear. Now, A second thing for us to to think about. Who are we fighting? Okay, so, first of all, we know that our kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is heavenly. But the Bible says something about our warfare on earth. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. We're all familiar with this verse. Ephesians chapter 6. Not only do we know we have a kingdom that is not of this world, it's a heavenly kingdom, but also we know that we are, as Christians to be engaged in a warfare, but our warfare is spiritual. It's not physical. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Not the wiles of the Jews or the Gentiles or the unbelievers. No, who is against me? The wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So I understand from this verse, along with what Jesus taught me, that I am in warfare, but my warfare is spiritual. And I am called to wrestle. Wrestling is hand-to-hand combat. Wrestling, really, you get in there. But we as Christians are called to do that because my enemy, I can't see. My enemy, I can't... He's invisible. And my enemy is, is destroyed or overcome, not by physical weapons but by spiritual weapons. And so who do we fight? We're fighting Satan and his principalities and powers of darkness. Now, how do we fight? 
How do we fight in this spiritual battle? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. It's very clear. For though we are in this body and we're on this earth, we don't fight as somebody in the flesh, a physical battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not earthly and they're not physical. But mighty in God, they're in God, for pulling down strongholds. Think about that. When you are sharing with a Muslim, you have been called to pull down a stronghold because there is a stronghold. There is a fortress, a satanic fortress around them. And it is by knowing this, knowing the Word of God, number one, and number two, knowing what you believe and why you believe it in order to pull down the stronghold. So he says there, Casting down arguments. Here's another thing that you are called to do. You are to cast down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see, when we as Christians become we get on fire for Jesus, then it means we're going to be obedient. And when we are obedient to God, then we are going to punish all disobedience. And that's how we're going to win the world for Jesus, by obeying God's word and by bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So we looked at what Jesus taught, what the New Testament teaches, who are we fighting, and how are we fighting. Okay? Now, let's go into Islam and jihad in Islam. So this is, jihad is holy war in Islam. So look at this. The very question and raising of the issue, is Islam a religion of peace, is a revealing question. Think about it. Just the very fact when people are asking all over the world, is Islam a religion of peace? We don't have the topic of debate, is Christianity... Or Judaism, a religion of peace, that's never a, a debate. It's never a question. The very fact of the question causes you to wonder and causes you to, to doubt, to say, well, why is there a challenge? There must be a reason for the challenge, right? Okay. So here, the following section I have here written in the, in the middle. The following section on jihad was taken from a course on Islam by Joe Carey. This is a fellow brother who's ministering in Texas. And he had some very great information that he allowed me to use. So jihad defined. The word jihad has a somewhat broad lexical meaning. First of all, it speaks of a struggle or striving. At the most basic level, the word jihad means to strive or struggle, particularly as it applies to the desire of Muslims to please Allah. Jihad is most often defined as striving in the way of Allah, struggling to do that which pleases Allah or exerting oneself with regard to one's religion. Okay, so this is one of the basic meanings of jihad. And this is one of the meanings that most Muslims will actually turn to. And they'll say, jihad is really an internal struggle. It's us striving to please Allah. It's us fighting our own selfish desires. It's fighting ourself. It's the fight, an internal fight. Okay. Now, did you know that the Bible refers to striving or struggling? First of all, striving as something that God commends in the spiritual life. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. I find this interesting because sometimes this is this is a word or a term that we don't really relate to in Christianity. But yet the Bible speaks about it. Striving is something that God commends in the Christian life. Okay, Luke 13, verse 24. 
What did Jesus say? Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. That's a very, that's not a verse that you hear very often. Jesus doesn't simply say enter in through the narrow gate, but he says strive to enter through the narrow gate. Okay, turn to Colossians 1.29. Colossians 1.29, this is Paul the Apostle, and he says this, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. So this is very interesting because Paul says that he's laboring, but he says to this end he labors, striving according to his working. So, there's two parts. There's two sides. It's Paul striving and struggling to walk with God. But then he says, but it is according to his mighty work. Okay? It is according to his mighty work. So, Paul speaks of a striving to please the God and to serve him. And then go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Matthew 11, verse 12. And this is also one of those verses that are very interesting. (laughs) Jesus, he says in verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Wow, interesting. (laughs) The Lord actually just gave me these verses just this week. I didn't even have these prepared. But I want us to think about it because it's easy to actually forget and say, wait a minute, Jesus taught an internal striving and a struggling. And listen to what Spurgeon, Spurgeon said about this verse where he says, the violent take it by force. Spurgeon said, there should be a violent anxiety to be saved there should be a violent anxiety to be saved you see when I follow Jesus there needs to be an earnestness to come to the Lord is not like okay yeah I'll follow Jesus yeah I'll accept him into my heart I I understand that he forgave me all my sins that person doesn't understand Christianity when there's true repentance and when there's true reconciliation, when I understand I'm going to follow God with all my heart and I'm going to strive, I'm going to seek to please Him. But guess what? There is a striving to deny my flesh every day. But God is working in me. So there's you, you have to obey God and deny your flesh, but there's God working in you. It doesn't happen without one without the other. For somebody to say, Oh, all of my life, it's all God doing it. Well, yes, but no. You have to, when God says, don't do that, don't get angry, you have to not get angry. But it's God working in you. But when we start to use sometimes Christianese and say, well, it's all God. No, it's not all God. God said, do this, and you did it. So God worked in you, but you obeyed Him. You see? And so that's what we see. But Spurgeon said, there should be a violent anxiety to be saved. But there is the other side of the coin. Striving is also something that God condemns. Look at 2 Timothy 2.24. 2 Timothy 2.24. He says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. That word quarrel is strive. Okay? Or the word to fight, struggle, quarrel. But be gentle to all, able to teach, patience. 
Okay, so here we see that God condemns having an evil heart that desires to fight or quarrel because what does Jesus teach us? He said, if you have hatred towards your brother in your heart, you have committed murder, right? And so we see that God condemns an actual physical fighting or striving, but God commends when we are striving against our flesh and seeking to please Him with all of our heart, okay? So that's what the Bible has to say. Now, let's go back here to our notes. The Encyclopedia of Islam says of jihad that in law, according to general doc doctrine and in historical tradition, the jihad consists of military action with the object of the expansion of Islam and if need be its defense. So notice what it said. It consists of military action with the object of expansion. So it always is describing jihad is military action desiring to expand Islam. <coughs> Going on, jihad is defined as warfare authorized by a legitimate representative of the Muslim community for the sake of an issue that is universally or nearly universally acknowledged to be of critical importance for the entire community against an admitted, an admitted enemy of Islam. One common understanding of jihad is defined as an internal struggle or a struggle against the inner self or inner desires. This definition is one preferred by moderate Muslims as well as those in the media and academia who would have us believe that Islam has no historical connection at all to violence and is purely a religion of peace. The beginnings of a demilitarized or peaceful concept of jihad in ancient Islamic literature can be traced to the 8th and 9th centuries, long after the death of Muhammad. Okay, what, what they are trying to tell us is this idea of a peaceful, demilitarized, meaning there was no military action. You know, Muhammad just preached and he told people, receive or reject Islam as you wish. And then people, some received, and some rejected, but nobody was killed and conquested and destroyed. He said this idea comes from the 8th and 9th century after Muhammad died, but it was never the reality, never the truth. And this is actually the meaning that you will see throughout the media. Okay? When the media says, and we're going to see a clip where Obama says, there is no religion on earth that would approve of killing in the name of of God or in the name of Allah, okay? This is exactly what the media wants us to believe. And they've been deceived. And most of them don't even know their own, they don't know their stuff at all. Because if they study the Quran and the Hadith, as we're going to look at today, then their eyes will be open. However, many do know, but they choose to turn a blind eye. That's the truth. So jihad as a spiritual struggle lacks any support in the Islamic canonical literature. So this idea of a spiritual struggle that jihad is, it really lacks in the Islamic canonical literature. It's not in there. For example, in Bukhari, okay, Bukhari is one of the hadith, okay? So remember, you have the two authoritative texts in Islam is the Quran, which is directly from Allah, from God, and you have the hadith, okay? The strongest hadith, is from Sahih Bukhari. Bukhari is his name. Sahih means the most reliable. It means strong, reliable. So almost every Sunni Muslim in the world will attest, yes, if it's in the, in the Hadith Bukhari, we believe it. Okay, because this is the words of Muhammad and the actions of Muhammad. So in Bukhari, of the 72 times the word jihad is used, it always speaks of fighting a war in the cause of Allah. Interesting. Scholars who study and analyze Middle East culture note that spiritual jihad is merely a facade created in an attempt to disguise the truth of jihad, hiding behind the facade to those of us in the West. Jihad as a spiritual struggle is presented only to Western audiences. It's only to you, 
if we transport ourselves into the Middle East, and if we all understood Arabic, and we watched the programs, and we watched the scholars from Egypt and from Iraq and all, you will not hear this spiritual struggle. It's for the people in the West. Let them hear that so they'll be deceived. Because as, as Muslims will come into the culture and, and come into society, they will be able to adapt, and then Islam will expand peacefully so that then it can be mm -hmm. taken by force. This is only in the West. Jihad as a spiritual struggle, I'm sorry I read that. Quote, few Muslim scholars or even apologists writing in non-European languages have ever made the exaggerated claims regarding spiritual struggle. Those who write in Arabic or other Muslim languages realize that it is pointless to present jihad as anything other than militant warfare. This is from David Cook's book, Understanding Jihad. Sahih Bukhari from the Hadith also includes the possibility of martyrdom as a consequence of jihad, meaning somebody may die, they may lose their life in the fight for Islam. Becoming a martyr is an odd concept if jihad is limited to an internal struggle alone. Okay? It would make no sense that, some, that the Quran talks over and over again, as we're going to see, that you will lose your life, give of your life, lose it for the sake of Allah. If it's referring to only a spiritual struggle of you denying your flesh, it wouldn't make sense. It's unreasonable. So now let's look at warfare. A footnote in the English translation of Bukhari's Hadith collection notes, El Jihad, this means holy fighting. Jihad in Allah's cause with full force of numbers and weaponry, is given the utmost importance in Islam and is one of the pillars on which it stands. By jihad, Islam is established, Allah's word is made superior, and His religion, Islam, is propagated. Over 160 verses in the Quran speak of jihad as fighting or killing. Here are just a sample of some, okay? But there are 160, over 160 verses. For example, Surah 2, verse 216. Jihad, holy fighting in Allah's cause, is ordained for you. He tells them, this is ordained for you. Surah 4, verse 74. Whoso fights in the cause of Allah and is killed or gets victory, we shall bestow on him a great reward. Surah 8, verse 39. Fight them on until there is no more tumult or oppression, and there prevail justice and faith in Allah altogether and everywhere. Surah 9, verse 29. This one is probably the most well-known. This is a good one. If you're going to memorize any, memorize Surah 9, 29. Just the reference. Surah 9, 29. Fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, which is Muhammad, and those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, which is Islam, among the people of the Scripture, which is Jews and Christians. So he says those who are of the Jews and Christians who do not acknowledge that Islam is from God, you are to fight them. And in fact, the word fight is in English, but in the Arabic it says to kill. Okay? It means to kill. Surah 47 verse 4. So when you meet in fight, jihad in Allah's cause, those who disbelieve smite their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them. So this is clear, and this is, why you're, this is why you see in the news where they behead people. They're beheading Christians and behead others, okay? They will even behead other Muslims. Why? Because Muslims who are moderate or who do not fight in jihad or refuse to, they are considered by many of these Muslims as non-believers, even another Muslim, okay? Number three, 
The Hadith also speaks extensively of jihad as warfare and nothing else. This is from uh, Bukhari, 2783 reference. When you are called by the Muslim ruler for jihad, which is holy fighting in Allah's cause, you are to go forth immediately. So this is not something that you are to resist, you are to obey. If the ruler of the land tells you to go and fight in jihad, you are to fight. If not, then you can be killed. Number four, note, however, that in many cases, warfare was preceded by a call to Islam. The target person or people group were first given an opportunity to embrace Islam. Okay, this is a quote from Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qarawani in his book, Decline of Eastern Christianity. It is preferable not to begin hostilities with the enemy before having invited the latter to embrace the religion of Allah, except where the enemy attacks first. They have the alternative of either converting to Islam or paying the poll tax, short of which war will be declared against them. So in Islam, it says that as a Muslim, you are to first invite people to become a Muslim. That's sort of the evangelism, okay? You are to tell them, this is what you are to believe. Believe in Allah. Believe in His Messenger, which is Muhammad. You are to believe in Judgment Day and believe that Islam is a religion from Allah. If you don't, then you have the, the option of paying a poll tax. So you are to pay money, which in Arabic is called jizya, okay? And the jizya, you are to pay that to the ruler of the land in order that he protects you and that you can remain alive. If you don't pay, then you will be killed. So it's either convert or pay or be killed. But they will, those that, have, that, that may engage you in discussion may say, well, it always comes first to invite them, to invite them first to Islam. Then if they reject, then of course, yes, you, you kill them. Well, that makes it a lot easier. Okay, look at Surah 8, verse 12, where we see where the idea of terrorism and where we see in the Quran it teaches terror. It says there in Surah 8, 12, Remember thy Lord inspired the angels with the message. I am with you. Give firmness to the believers. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Look at what he says. Smite ye above their necks and smite all their fingertips off them. This is what the revelation of Allah gave to Muhammad in the Quran. And the more we study it, the more you will see the Allah of the Quran is not the God of the Bible. He is a different God. Okay. Now, look at martyrdom. The evil idea of martyrdom for the sake of Allah is rooted in the Quran. In his article, Islamic Martyrdom, What a Bargain, James Arlinson said this, Indeed, these three references explicitly use words that connote buying and selling and signing a contract of sale and the currency behind the deals is death by martyrdom. These verses guarantee Islamic martyrs heaven in an economic bargain. So you will see in these verses as if Allah is saying, look, we're going to do a deal. You sell your life to me and you be killed in the name of me and I will give you heaven. Okay, look at these verses. Surah 61 verses 10 through 12. O ye who believe... Shall I show you a commerce that will save you from a painful doom? Okay, and many times when you're reading, it doesn't even make sense. Okay, it's, it's because you can only really understand it in Arabic. Ye should believe in Allah and His Messenger and should strive, there's the word jihad, you should strive for the cause of Allah with your wealth and your lives. That is better for you. If ye did but know. He will forgive you your sins and bring you into gardens underneath which rivers flow and pleasant dwellings in gardens of Eden. That is the supreme triumph. Excuse me. Now something you will notice if you ever read the Quran, whenever 
Allah promises the Muslim paradise or heaven, it always speaks of gardens and it speaks of rivers. And the reason why that is, is because Muhammad and Islam started in the land of the desert, in an area of the desert. And so this to them was something that was desirable. Okay, And when you read the Quran, you can see everything was according to that place and that time and that location. All right. Second, Surah 4, verse 74. Let those fight in the way of Allah who sell the life of this world for the other. Whoso fighteth in the way of Allah, be he slain or be he victorious, on him we shall bestow a vast reward. So again, encouraging them to fight because they will receive a reward if they die. And third verse, Surah 9, verse 111. Lo, Allah hath bought from the believers their lives and their wealth, because the garden will be theirs. They shall fight in the way of Allah and shall slay and be slain. It is a promise which is binding on him in the Torah and the Gospel and the Quran. Look at here. This is Allah speaking in the Quran. He's bringing in the Torah, which is our Old Testament, and the, the Gospel and the Quran. He says it's in there. It's binding on him. Who fulfilleth his covenant better than Allah? Rejoice then in your bargain that ye have made, for that is the supreme triumph. So this idea of martyrdom is in the Quran. And you can understand why would somebody as a Muslim want to give their life to take the lives of unbelievers and die because he will be promised paradise. Okay, what is the purpose of jihad? You have several purposes of jihad. Number one, to rid the world of polytheists. That would be us. Okay, we are considered, we're going to be dealing with this, you and I are considered a polytheist. Poly, many, theists, God. Okay, for the Muslim, you and I believe in three gods. Okay? And remember, when Muhammad started in Mecca, he came, he started in a place of idolatry, polytheism. There were 360 gods. So his revelation from Allah was, there is one God. Go and destroy all the other gods and set up the worship of one God. And so that's what a, Mu a Muslim feels proud and boasts about. They, Islam is the religion that brought monotheism. Okay, this is what, they're, uh, what they understand. So, so jihad is to rid the world of polytheists, unbelievers, and hypocrites. Okay, a hypocrite would be somebody even as a Muslim who is not practicing prayer, who is not practicing jihad if commanded to. And obviously they are in the Quran and other things, the five pillars of Islam. Number two, jihad is to spread Islam. It's intended to spread Islam throughout the earth. Number three, jihad is to test the true followers of Allah, who will obey and who will not. Number four, to obtain booty. Okay, When they go into battle, they conquered and they took over merchants and tradesmen and they got wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And this is the thing you see with Muhammad. He began poor and he ended up wealthy and rich and powerful. Number five, assure one's place in paradise, as we saw in the previous verses. And there's a sixth, sixth thing, and I'm going to read this from the Quran. It is the highest honor by Allah. He gives highest honor to the one who practices jihad. Listen to this. You might want to add that in there. I don't think I have it in there. In Surah 4, So as a Muslim, one Muslim by Allah is considered higher than another Muslim. Okay. Think about that in our, in our faith. Does God ever in His Word say, you are higher or better than this other Christian here if you do A, B, or C? Okay, look at this. Surah 4, verses 95 through 96. Okay, listen. I'm sorry, got the wrong. This is the. Okay. 
Okay, here it is. Not equal are those believers who sit at home except those who are disabled. So unless you are handicapped and you can't go anywhere. And those who strive and fight jihad in the cause of Allah with their goods and their persons. So with your finances, with your money, and with yourself. Allah has granted a grade higher to those who strive and fight with their goods and persons than to those who sit at home. Unto all in faith has Allah promised good. So to every person, God, He promises good, Allah. But those who strive and fight has He distinguished above those who sit at home by a great reward. Ranks specially bestowed by Him and forgiveness and mercy. For Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. So he always says that he is very forgiving and very merciful. But there is a higher rank if somebody fights in jihad. Okay, some methods. What are the methods of jihad? Well, number one, they take disbelievers or unbelievers captive. And you saw that throughout the life of Muhammad. In those years when he went from Mecca and he grew in his following to Medina and then from Medina back to establish Islam in Mecca, you see that he took many, many captives. Many, many captives. And number two, a method of jihad is obviously to kill the disbelievers or unbelievers. Now, the Quran reveals three stages of jihad. And this is what a lot of people, the majority of Christians do not know this. There are three stages of jihad in the life and in the history of Islam. And then along with that, we need to understand something. There is what the verses and the surahs in the Quran are divided up into two categories. Two. The Meccan surahs and the Medinan surahs. The surahs which came to Muhammad, supposedly from Allah, in Mecca, right? When he was small and weak and he didn't have much of a following. And then you have the verses that came to him when he went to Medina. And then he grew and became powerful. So what happens is the verses and the surahs that came to Muhammad in Mecca, they are calm, they are gentle, they are peaceful. And those are the verses that Muslims in the West will refer to. But those are the Meccan verses. And we're going we're gonna to cover the reason why. Because later in the Medinan verses, then they were violent. Then they were aggressive. And those came later. Okay. But let's look here at the three stages of jihad. Number one, the first stage. When Muslims are outnumbered, they are to proclaim a message of peace. Okay, so think about the world. Think about where Muslims are. Okay, when they are outnumbered, they are to proclaim a message of peace. Surah 2, verse 256. This is one that every Muslim in the West talks about and, and speaks out loud. There is no compulsion in religion. Hey, you see Islam in Surah 256 says, there is no compulsion in religion. There is no force. You can believe what you want to believe. We believe what we believe. That's fine. There's, there's no problem. Surah 109, verse 6. Unto you, your religion, and unto me, my religion. Sounds great. Wonderful. <laughs> if only they would do this. Now, if a person thinks, you, you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. You just said the Meccan verses, which was earlier in Islamic history, those were peaceful. And the later verses, which are Medinan verses, those were violent. So how come Surah 2, the second surah or second chapter, is in the beginning of the Quran, but then we have Surah 109, it's way later in the Quran, and that's peaceful. Who has an answer for that? Who remembers what I said? What? It's not chronological. It's not chronological. Yeah. Okay, the Quran is not chronological. Literally one verse in a surah may have happened early, and then the very next verse may have happened 15 years, 10 years later. So you have no idea, okay? The only way you know is in the hadith. And the people who have studied the hadith that's why they know and they can break it down and say these are Meccan and these are Medinian. Okay? 
It's very complicated. But just so you know. Number two, and by the way, when you are talking with a Muslim, and when you, when you share these things that you are learning right here, immediately you have knowledge. Because the majority, I guarantee, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the majority of Christians, first of all, do not know any of this. And second of all, many Muslims don't even know this. But if they go and, and, and verify what you say, they're going to hold respect for you. Because you just said, yes, yeah, some verses are Meccan and some are Medinan. Okay? So number two, this is the second stage of jihad. When Muslim numbers increase, they are permitted to engage in defensive wars. Okay, so now they move from you, your religion, my, my, I keep mine. I'm at peace. No, no violence. To now, when you begin to increase, now you can fight in defense. In defense. So look at Surah 22, verses 39 through 40. Sanction is given unto those who fight because they have been wronged. And Allah is indeed able to give them victory. Those who have been driven from their homes unjustly only because they said, Our Lord is Allah. For had it not been for Allah's repelling some men by means of others, cloisters and churches and oratories and mosques, wherein the name of Allah is oft mentioned, would assuredly have been pulled down. Verily, Allah helpeth one who helpeth him. Lo, Allah is strong, almighty. And here is another verse for you. Write this down. Surah 5, verse 33. Surah 5, verse 33. So Muslims can engage in defensive wars. It says, The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and His Messenger and strive with might and main for mischief through the land is... So now he, Allah in the Quran tells Muhammad and the Muslims, there is a punishment for anybody who fights against the Muslims and against Muhammad and against Allah. And this, and they cause mischief. Okay, it's very vague. If you cause mischief in the land, there is a punishment for you. Either execution or crucifixion. Okay, what is ISIS doing? They're crucifying. All they're doing, guys, is obeying their scripture, obeying their, their Quran. Crucifixion or cutting off hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land. Okay, what have they been doing? A lot of people have just been exiled and they've become refugees. That is their disgrace in this world and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter. So, this is the Quran, this is what Allah has, has revealed to Muhammad. Those who fight, those who cause mischief, they are to, these are the punishments for them. Now the third stage of jihad. The third stage. When Muslims are the majority, they are commanded to fight in offensive wars. So now, when they become stronger and more in number then they will fight in offensive wars. Whether you're fighting them or not, they're going to fight you and take over. Surah 929. Fight against such of those who have been given the scripture as believe not in Allah nor the last day and forbid not that which Allah hath forbidden by his messenger and follow not the religion of truth. That's Islam, the religion of truth. Until they pay the tribute readily being brought low. See, it even says, until they are brought low, meaning humiliated. Okay. Now, so these are the three stages. So you can see the three stages of jihad. And this is what was practiced in the life of Muhammad. Now, consider this. If there is no compulsion in religion, as it said there in Surah 2, 256, and this is what most Muslims in the West will always use, if there's no compulsion in religion, then it should apply in believing and also in disbelieving. 
Because think about it. If I say, I'm not going to force you to believe, but are you going to force me to stay if I don't want to believe anymore? Right? If I choose to leave my belief, are you going to force me or are you going to let me? Okay? It's irrational to say it applies only in believing. So, concerning the statistics, we should say Islam is the fastest growing enforced religion in the world. Okay? So when we hear that Islam is the fastest growing religion, it's because, first of all, if I have a family of eight kids, me and my wife, obviously I count that we're 10 Muslims in this house. Okay? Irrelevant of what are they believing or what are they doing. They may not be following Islam at all. So that's number one. Number two, those in Islamic countries that are staying Muslim simply because if they leave, they'll be killed. So I'm going to stay. So they're a Muslim out of fear. So it's the fastest growing enforced religion in the world. Because you can come to us and believe, but if you leave us, then we'll kill you. Okay? It is very much like a mafia. Mm -hmm. yeah? it, is, it is very much like a mafia. And I've, I've said that to, to Muslims where I've, I've had a good friendship with them. And I've said, this is, this is a mafia, my friend. Now, <clears throat> jihad versus the Crusades. This is something that always comes up. Muslims will like to say, well, you had the Christian Crusades. Look at how many Muslims and others, the Christians, in the name of the cross, they're on their shields, the Europeans with their crosses on the shields, and where they killed people and slayed people by the hundreds and thousands. And so many other things. Muslims will bring up what's happening in Ireland between the Protestants and the Catholics and other places of the world where Christians are killing, okay? This is, to me, it's a very easy argument. The issue is you're comparing what Muhammad did in the name of religion, in the name of Islam, and what people are doing that is not led by Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? The Crusades were never commanded by Jesus Christ. We do not see Jesus Christ saying, follow me, let us go kill in the name of, of Christ, and let's spread the gospel. And whoever doesn't believe in Jesus, that he died and rose again, and whoever doesn't repent of their sins, they should be killed. Jesus never commanded that. What the Crusaders did, they did in spite of the Bible. What, what, uh, what people in jihad do, they are doing because of the Quran. You see, there's a big difference. So the Crusades holds no water, and anything in history holds no water. Because unless a person can validate their actions by the word of God, it holds no water. And so we can talk about the many religions of the world. If it's not here, I don't believe it. Oh, well, people do this. I've had discussions with you know, Muslims where they say, well, you, 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 you cannot marry. How are you married? You, you're not supposed to marry. I said, where did you hear that? So they have ideas from the Catholic priests that you can't marry. So then I show them in the Bible. Marriage. God created marriage. He never said that. And then they begin to start to say, oh. So you begin to break down walls and misconceptions and misunderstandings from a Muslim. Okay? But how else does that happen? Dialogue. You've got to talk. You've got to dialogue. So, next, before we end the issue of jihad, we have to look at the law of abrogation in the Quran. And then I'm, I'm, we're going to take just a real quick break. The law of abrogation in the Quran. This is very important to know. Why? Because this is where you see the Meccan verses and the Medinan verses. And which one holds water? Which one do you follow? Okay. So, this is the canceling of early verses in the Quran and replacing or overruling them with later and better verses. That is what the word abrogate means. Okay. And it's in the Quran. Okay? It's in the Quran. In Arabic, nasikh u mensukh. Okay, so for those Arabic speakers. So, the law of abrogation, when early verses are canceled and replaced by a later verse. So, Surah 2, verse, one, uh, verse 106. 
such of our revelations, this is Allah speaking, such of our revelations as we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better or the like thereof. Know you not that Allah is able to do all things? Allah is saying, don't you know I can do anything I want? So I'll bring this and just scratch that verse. This cancels that verse. See, but the problem is the Muslims need to know that. They need to be aware. Look at what the Quran says. So we are bringing the Quran. This is the word of Allah. This is untouchable. He says, I bring verses now that cancel those verses. So when you say there's no compulsion in religion, this verse cancels that one. So you have a problem. Okay, write this down. Surah, another one. Surah 16. Surah 16. Verse 101. 101. So I'm giving you two verses here so that you can have a basis for this. And once again, any Muslim that rejects what you say and say, no, that's not true, they can go and verify it. I always encourage them, go ask your imam. Don't believe me what I'm saying. Go, take this, ask your imam and see if it's true. Because we know it to be true. Surah 16, verse 101. <clears throat> Allah says, When we substitute one revelation for another, and God knows best what He reveals, they say, okay, He says, they say, meaning the polytheists or the unbelievers outside of Islam. They say, you are but a fabricator. Indeed, most of them have no knowledge. You see, Allah, He's very intelligent. He said, when I, when I bring something that substitutes one revelation for another, and they begin to tell you, Muhammad, you are a fabricator, you're making up things. Remember what we talked about, Muhammad? That they said he was demon-possessed, they said he was a magician, they said he was you know, saying to worship even other goddesses and bringing that in with Islam. And they said, you're a fabricator. Allah says, indeed, most of them have no knowledge. So don't listen to them, they're fools, they're ignorant. Okay, so that's what he says. <clears throat> This justified Muhammad's change from moderate to very harsh treatment of non-Muslims. So this is why he could justify it. Because those earlier verses are now canceled by the later. And the later is what they now, what stands. And those are the violent verses, which were the Medinan verses. Now, I'm going to show you a video one of my heroes of the faith. <clears throat> so this man here that's going to speak, he's a Moroccan from Morocco. His name is Rashid. Well, his name is Rashid, Brother Rashid. Okay, because he is, because he's on television and he's on the internet, he has a TV program once a week that goes, because of satellite television and because of the internet, it is broadcast throughout the whole world. And he has a call-in show. So he will talk about subjects that are Islamic from the Quran, from the Hadith, from their scholars, and then he will talk about it. And then people will call in from Saudi Arabia, from England, Canada, Australia, anywhere in the world. Some people will receive Christ on the air. It's incredible. And he speaks about, um, about jihad and he speaks English. So he's going to share here. One of my heroes right here. What happened? Let's rewind. Did you hear that? He said ISIS, he said ISIL, he likes to say ISIL, is not Islamic. No, no, no religion condones the killing of innocent people. Okay, let's just. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents. And the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. And ISIL is certainly not a state. Dear Mr. President, 
With all due respect, sir, I must tell you that you are wrong about ISIL. You said ISIL speaks for no religion. I'm a former Muslim. My dad is an Imam. I spent more than 20 years studying Islam. I hold a bachelor degree in religious studies, and I'm in the middle of my master's degree in terrorism studies. I can tell you with confidence that ISIL speaks for Islam. Allow me to correct you, Mr. President. ISIL is a Muslim organization. Its name stands for Islamic State. So even the name suggests that it is an Islamic movement. Their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, holds a PhD in Islamic studies. I doubt you know Islam better than he does. He was a preacher and a religious leader in one of the local mosques in Baghdad. ISIL's 10,000 members are all Muslims. None of them are from any other religion. They come from different countries and have one common denominator, Islam. They are following Islam's prophet Muhammad in every detail. They imitate him by growing their beards, shaving their mustaches, and in the way they dress. They follow his command in the hadith to differentiate themselves from the infidels by wearing, by wearing their watches on the right instead of the left hand. They implement Sharia in every piece of land they conquer. They pray five times a day. They have called for a caliphate, which is a central doctrine in Sunni Islam and they are willing to die for their religion. They are following the steps of Islam's prophet Muhammad to the letter. By the way, if you want to understand ISIL, read the oldest biography of Muhammad by Ibn Hisham. This is their model for action. You think that ISIL does not speak for Islam because they beheaded an American and they killed those whom they consider infidels. In the same way, Islam's prophet Muhammad beheaded in one day between 600 and 900 adult males in a Jewish tribe called Banu Quraiza. In fact, beheading is commanded in the Quran, in Surah 47, the fourth verse. It says, when you meet the unbelievers and fight, smite at their necks. Ironically, this surah is called the Surah of Muhammad. Killing prisoners is also an order from Allah to Muhammad and to all Muslims. It says it is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah's enemies in the land. Quran 8:67. And by the way, three of Muhammad's wives were Jewish girls he kidnapped from his raids on the religious minorities, just as ISIL is doing today. Mr. President, I grew up in Morocco, supposedly a moderate country, yet I still learned at a young age to hate the enemies of Allah, especially Jews and Christians. These are represented today by Israel and the West, especially the great Satan, America. I prayed five times a day, repeating Al-Fatiha, the first chapter in the Quran, asking Allah to lead me not in the way of those who went astray and those who have the wrath of Allah upon them. We all knew that it is Jews and Christians. We have been brainwashed to hate all of you in our sacred texts, in our prayers, in our Friday sermons, in our educational systems. We were ready to join any group that one day would fight you and destroy you and make Islam the religion of the whole world as the Quran says. This is what I and millions like me have been taught. Mr. President, this is an irrevocable fact. Fortunately, when I grew up, I chose to leave Islam and became a Christian because I believed that God is love. Others also left and still every day they are leaving Islam and choosing different paths for their lives. All of them are suffering today because, again, 
Islam's prophet Muhammad said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. I left Morocco under persecution. I was fortunate. Others throughout the Muslim world do not have the same opportunity. They are paying a heavy price in different ways in order to get their freedom one day. I ask you, Mr. President, to stop being politically correct, to call things by their names. ISIL, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the Taliban, and their sister brand names are all made in Islam. Unless the Muslim world deals with Islam and separates religion from state, we will never end this cycle. Until you deal with the root of the problem, we'll be just dealing with the symptoms. ISIL is just one symptom. If it disappears, other ISILs will be born under different names. You might ask, then why does ISIL kill other Muslims? The answer is that they consider them infidels, not Muslims. Do you know that all four schools in Islam agree that if a Muslim stops praying, he should be asked to repent, and if he does not, he should be killed? Do you know that Muhammad tried to burn his own companions when they stopped coming to prayers? So anything that qualifies a Muslim to be an infidel can be a reason for killing him, even neglecting to pray. If Islam is not the problem, then why is it that there are millions of Christians in Middle East and yet none of them has ever blown up himself to become a martyr? Even though they live under the same economic and political circumstances and even worse. Why have many Muslims in the West also joined ISIL if Islam is not the reason? Why have even new converts to Islam become terrorists? Mr. President, if you really want to fight terrorism, then fight it at the root. How many Saudi sheikhs are preaching hatred? How many Islamic channels are indoctrinating people and teaching them violence from the Quran and the Hadith? How many Friday sermons are made against the West, freedom and democracy? How many Islamic schools are producing generations of teachers and students who believe in jihad and martyrdom and fighting the infidels? And finally, how many websites are funded by governments, your allies, that have sheikhs or issue fatwas against basic human rights? If you want to fight terrorism, start from there. By the way, I do not give my full name because Islam is a religion of peace. I'm known around the whole world as Brother Rashid, and I implore you to take a stand for international human rights and the future of democracy and speak the truth about the real threat that is facing all of us. Best regards, Brother Rashid. <laughs>
Okay, I'm just going to go over the very last one, part three on there, if you have it. And just go over those words. Because we're going to be um, dealing with these words here. So here we go. So the Old Testament, which is the books of Moses, but is referred to as the Old Testament, is the Taurat. Taurat. The Psalms in Arabic is the Zabur. Zabur. The New Testament or the Gospel of, of, of Jesus is the Injil. Injil. Okay, important words. Adam in Arabic is Adam. It's almost the same. Abraham is Ibrahim, Ibrahim. Moses is Musa, Musa. David is Dawood, Dawood. John the Baptist is Yehia, Yehia. The Word of God, which is one of Jesus' names in the Quran, the Word of God is Kalimet Allah, Kalimet Allah. The cross in Arabic, as-salib, as-salib. Christian, a male, would be Messihi, Messihi. And a, a Christian female for a girl would be Messihiya, Messihiya. The A at the end makes it feminine, pretty much for any word in Arabic. So Messihi, I'm Messihi, you are Messihiya. The way, at-tariq. At-tariq. The truth, al-haq. Al-haq. That's a hard letter to pronounce. <laughs> Haq. The life, al-hayat. Al-hayat. The mediator, al-wasit. Al-wasit. God is love. Allah huwa mahabba. That's love. Mahabba. Allah huwa mahabba. Love is mahabba. In Arabic, Mahabba. Church, Kenisa. Kenisa. Family, A'ila. A'ila. The Lord bless you. Arab, Ibarak Fik. Arab, Ibarak Fik. It's fun to say. Arab. If you can say it. Arab, Ibarak Fik. The Lord, Rab. The Lord be with you. Arab, Mac. Arab Mac. So those are wor those are things that I say to Muslims when I say God bless you. I'll say Arab Ibarak Fik. I will say to them, I will say God bless you, because Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, bless those that curse you. So we are to give them blessings. So I tell them God bless you. May God bless you. Bless you with salvation. Bless you with knowledge of Him. So we move on here to Islamic objections. And we're going to deal with two of them. The next session, we're going to finish off the other four. So there are two. Real quick. Is it the word of God, one of the name Jesus in the Quran? Yes. They consider Jesus the word of God? Yes. Those are one of His names in the Quran. Yes. He is the word of God. So, before we know the Word of God, we must know the God of the Word. If we're going to evangelize and reach Muslims for Jesus, we've got to have a relationship with God. We cannot give what we don't have, right? We've all heard that. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, you know, Paul says, That which was delivered unto me, the gospel, I give to you. That Jesus, according to the Scriptures, was taken, was crucified, died, and was buried according to the Scriptures. And Paul says there, what was delivered to me, I give to you. So what's really important as Christians is we understand, I can't give if I don't have. I need to know the God of the Word before I know the Word of God. Okay, And when I have that relationship with God through His Word, I am now able to be filled with His Spirit and be able to take the Gospel to, to the Muslims and be able to answer these questions and give an answer for my faith. So we are dealing with apologetics here, the Greek word apologia. It is A, a verbal defense. B, it is a reason, statement, or argument. Christian apologetics deals with the ability to provide an answer or a defense to those who criticize, oppose, or question the revelation of God 
Christ, and the Bible, as well as biblical doctrines. And I'm not going to go over those right now because we won't have the time, but you can see those verses there, Jude 3 through 4, 1 Peter 3, 15, where it says we are to give a defense of the hope that lies within us. And Paul many times refers to giving that, and he speaks of that word defense in the Greek apologia. And then you can see all through Acts, chapter 9, chapter 9, chapter 18, chapter 19 of Acts, Paul, there's different words that are used to describe his relationship. He would prove Jesus. He would dispute. He would reason. He would show many things to, to show that Paul was giving a defense for the faith. And as Jesus told us, John 8, 32, very important, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So how is a Muslim going to know Jesus Christ? Well, they need to know the truth and it will be the truth that will set them free. But you are his mouthpiece. You see, God could speak from heaven, but he chooses not to. He chooses to use you. And God says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So let's deal with the first issue. This is the, one of the first and, and top issues in Islam of the corruption of the Bible. The corruption of the Bible. So, this is the objection. This is what the Muslim will say and what they believe. God revealed throughout history four holy books containing God's word. The Torah, the Psalms, the Gospel, and the Quran. Four holy books. God gave these books to His holy prophets to communicate His will to mankind and lead them in the straight path. The first three holy books were revealed to the Jewish people. For a period of time, they were perfect and preserved by God. However, at one point, the Jewish people and Christians began to change and corrupt God's word, removing what they didn't like and adding to it what they wanted it to say. Thus, God's final revelation and holy book was the Quran. It was given to correct the corruption that occurred previously and bring all people everywhere back to the straight path of God. So this is what is in the mind of a Muslim. When they see your Bible and they know their Quran, this you cannot trust. It's corrupted. I can't trust it. It's been changed. It's been corrupted. Things added, things taken away. That's the Bible for the Muslim. Even the Psalms and the Bible? Yes, everything. Okay, now, okay, we're going to deal with this. Some background. So we need to know some things here. We must realize that the Quran clearly refers to the Torah, Psalms, and Gospel of Christ as originating with God, with Allah, and directs people to read them in order to confirm the Quran. Okay, very interesting. It tells them in the Quran to go to these books. Okay, let's go one by one. So, Torah. In Surah 5, verse 46, it says, And in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the Son of Mary. Okay, obviously it will never say the Son of God. It says the Son of Mary. Confirming, notice the words, confirming the law that had come before Him. We sent Him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him. The law is the Torah. A guidance and an admonition to those who fear Allah. Okay, so there you see the Torah was given. Allah says, I gave the Torah before the gospel, and the gospel confirms what was in the law, in the Torah, that I gave for guidance and light. So it's good. Allah gave it. This is for you to lead you in the right way. And I gave you some other references as well, okay, that mention about the Torah. Now, the Quran speaks of the Psalms, the Zabur, in Surah 17, verse 55. And it is your Lord that knoweth best all beings that are in the heavens and on earth. We did bestow on some prophets more and other gifts than on others. And we gave to David the gift of the Psalms. So there, Allah says, we gave to David, Daud, the gift of the Psalms. 
So we know the Torah is from God. We know the Psalms is from God. And last, the third, the Gospel of Jesus, the Injil in Arabic. Surah 5, verse 46. And in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law that had come before him. Okay, this is a repetition. We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him. A guidance and an admonition to those who fear Allah. Let, okay, now notice this is very, very, very important. Let the people of the gospel, who is that? That's us, Christians. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. Therein what? The gospel. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Now you really have to think about it and wrap your mind around what he said. Okay, we're going to talk about this. So, in the Quran, Allah says, I gave you the Torah, I gave you the Zabur, the Psalms of David, and I gave you the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It came from Allah, it came from heaven. Three. And of course, we're not going to talk about the Quran. For them, they believe the Quran came. So, you will, I will tell a Muslim, do you believe in four holy books? Yes. Four. Not five, not two, not one, not seven. Four. Okay. This is what the Quran says. Now, what is the problem? Since there are discrepancies between the Quran and the Bible, the Muslims believe that the Bible was corrupted. Okay? So obviously, because they follow the Quran, the Muslim says, your Bible has been corrupted because you don't believe in Muhammad. And you don't believe in A, B, and C. So your Bible is corrupted and changed. You say Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran doesn't say that. You say Jesus died on the cross. We don't believe in that. You say you believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Quran doesn't say that. So you must be wrong and we must be right. The Quran must be right. The Bible must be wrong. They wrongly judge. Look at the sentence. They wrongly judge the previous and older revelation by the newer revelation. So the Quran comes, which is the newest, and then they judge the older by the newer, rather than the newer judging it by the older. Okay? So, we have the Christian's response. Okay, so now we understand the problem, we understand the mind of the Muslim, what are they thinking? And we understand some background. What does the Quran say about the gospel, the Torah, and the Zabur? It says it's from God. No problems. Okay? Now, let me also tell you something else. Nowhere in the Quran does it say only this portion of the, of the Psalms or this portion of the Torah or this portion of the gospel. It just says the whole gospel. It doesn't, and it doesn't explain. Because uh, earlier, a couple sessions back, Someone asked me about, well, wait a minute, does it, is it the whole gospel? And what does it, does it break it down? They don't talk about, you know, like we have the gospel, you know, the Corinthians, the epistles of Corinthians, epistle to Ephesians, 1 John, 2 John. It doesn't talk about any specific, specific things. It just says the gospel, the Torah, the Zabur, okay? But they believe it's been corrupted. <coughs> so, number one. Since God has revealed to mankind four holy books from heaven, not human, but divine in origin, and it's indicated in their Quran, why would God allow sinful men to corrupt His word? Okay, so these are some things, these are what we're going to deal with here. These are the questions that I will bring a Muslim to. I just had this, I just had this discussion Friday, in Claremont, in front of a mosque. And we were there at 1 o'clock, 1.30. They came out, and I was with a college student, and we were talking for two and a half hours. And I had another, uh, my mom was here with a lady. They were talking for another hour, 
I had another couple here. They were talking with other people for another hour, two hours. We were there all the way till like five o'clock in the afternoon. And then they invited them into the mosque and they talked to the leaders. And the leader said, oh, I know Stephen. I know that guy. He's a troublemaker. (laughs) But they still want us to come back and they want to talk to us. But I talked about this very thing and I took him through these steps. I said, do you believe the four holy books came from Allah? Yes. So why would God allow sinful men to corrupt His word? It's not man's word. It's God's word. Is it not? They will say, yes, it is. So you're saying Allah allowed men to corrupt His word. Next question. Does God love and honor His own word? Yes, they will say. Is God omnipotent? Do you believe God is all-powerful? Yes. Do you believe that God is capable enough to preserve His Word? Yes. All these answers they will answer yes to. Question, can the Quran be corrupted? No. Well, the Quran is the Word of God. Yes. Was the Torah the Word of God? Yes. So why can this be corrupted but this can't? Leave the question with them, right? Okay. Surah 85, verses 21 through 22. You can read that. The Quran cannot be corrupted. If not, then why would he not preserve his previous holy books? So why would he not? Why would he allow the Torah, Zabur, and the Angel to be corrupted and changed? But the last one, no. He keeps it and preserves it. Why? Does God discriminate between his own holy books? and only choose to honor his final revelation? Okay, now, look at what the Bible says. So I will share with a Muslim. The Bible says this in Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Psalm 12, this is in the Zabur. And and why why, why am I specifically using these verses? I specifically am giving you these verses because they're in different places. So this is the Zabur from Psalms of David. So King David says, by the Holy, the Holy Spirit says through King David, Psalm 12, verses 6 through 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Watch it, verse 7, you shall keep them. Keep what? Your word, his word. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation for a hundred years, for 10,000 years, forever. Wow. God's word says it. It's in the Zabur. Did you know this? No, I didn't know this. Look at what the prophet Isaiah says. Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. Isaiah 40, verse 6. I'm going to move fast. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So my Muslim friend, God spoke through the prophet David. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and he said, the word of God stands forever. Okay, this is what God's word says. This is what my Bible says. And you believe in this. And you say the the gospel came from Allah. Well, let's look at the gospel. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. 17 through 18. So I'm just, what we're doing is you're showing the Muslim what the Bible says. At this point, I don't, I'm not arguing. I'm just reading and presenting. This is what the Word of God says. Jesus, the words of Jesus, Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law, which is the Torah, or the prophets, all of the prophets of the Old Testament. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Meaning, everything in God's word will come to pass that he said. Nothing will be changed, removed, corrupted. It's here and it's going to stand forever. 
Matthew 24, verse 35. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Okay, so this is what God's word says. It is immutable, unchangeable. Now, the Quran says in Surah 18, verse 27, there in your notes, Surah 18, verse 27, And recite and teach what has been revealed to thee of the book of thy Lord. None can change his words, and none wilt thou find as a refuge other than him. And I gave you some other references to look those up in the Quran later. But look at what it says. In their Quran, it says none can change God's words. And in my Bible, it says no one can change the word of God. It stands forever. So, next point. Since the Quran directs Muslims to go to the Bible, remember what it said. And to judge, this is what the surah said previously, to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, confirming that the Bible came before the Quran. And it is God's standard by which to judge everything. Then we must conclude that the Quran is corrupted and possibly human in origin. Okay, now, why do we say this? This is what's called the Islamic dilemma. A dilemma means you're in trouble if you go this way and you're in trouble if you go that way. So, either I'm going to listen to the Quran or I'm going to listen to the Bible. So this is what I tell my Muslim friend. If I listen to the Quran and obey it, your Quran tells me to judge the Quran by what was revealed before it in the Torah and the Gospel. And when I do that, it shows me that the Quran is false. If I go to the Bible and obey the Bible, the Bible tells me the Quran is false. Because you have a different God, you have a different story, you have a different complete idea of God. There is no, Jesus was crucified, here he was not crucified. So if I obey the Bible, the Quran is false. And if I go to the Quran, the Quran is false. So they have a dilemma. Are you following me? Yeah? Okay. So the genuine versus the counterfeit. And I shared this with my Muslim friend just this last week. I said, listen. I said, <clears throat> if, I look at that, if I look at this door and I say, and you ask me, how, how, how tall is that door? And I say, oh, it's about... Seven foot three inches, and you say, no, it's six foot nine inches. Who of us is right? Okay, both of us have an opinion. It's not until you come and bring the measuring tape, which is the standard, that will tell us what is right. Okay? The standard is the Word of God. You don't judge what came after. You don't judge the older revelation by what came after. It's the older that stands and the newer is telling us that this came after that this revelation which came before it was given by God so the newer has to match the older because the older is the standard this is the measuring tape i judge everything through the lens of the bible okay but this is what they need to know so since this is a serious problem then it demands serious answers so we also have to ask a Muslim, if you say the Bible has been changed, tell me who did it. Okay, if this happened, it would obviously be, there should be proof, there should be evidence. Who did it? There needs to be who. You have to answer who. When? When did this happen? Okay, is there a year? Is there a date? And was the Bible corrupted before Muhammad or after Muhammad? They cannot say before because the Quran tells them the Bible came from Allah. And if they say after, well, they have another issue. If the Bible was altered, then it must have been done after the Quran was revealed and compiled. How? How was it done? You have to ask a Muslim. If you think the Bible was corrupted, how was it changed? Listen, it would have been virtually impossible for a person or persons to go throughout the known world. Remember, this is 632. A.D., after the Quran was revealed. Approach everyone with a Bible or with the manuscripts of the Bible 
agree with them to surrender over their Bible or confiscate it, then change all the Bibles and return them all to their owners. And then we have to ask, what was changed? If a Muslim says, well, the Bible's been changed, okay, well, tell me what portions, what verses, what words, what stories. Because Muslims will also use the Bible to verify Muhammad. But then you have to say, well, wait a minute. When you're using the Bible, the Bible's been changed. So how can you use the Bible? So they have a dilemma. You see, they have a dilemma. And then lastly, we have overwhelming manuscript evidence. The Bible has the most manuscripts of any ancient literature in history. We have manuscripts of the New Testament that predate 632 AD, after the death of Muhammad, that shows us that it conflicts and disagrees with the Quran. So the things and the teachings of the Bible, we have manuscripts that predate 632 AD. So it's impossible for them to have this objection that the Bible has been changed or tampered with. The Word of God is immutable. It does not change. So they have a dilemma and they have to answer that. So that's objection number one that a Muslim will bring to you. A second objection, and this is a big one, is that of the Son of God. So every Muslim believes and will say that God does not have a son. Jesus is not the Son of God. Okay, so here is the objection. <clears throat> the Quran teaches that Allah is God alone. He is the creator and orig originator of all things that exist. He is eternal. He is unique and the supreme one. He is unlike humans in many areas, one of which he has no parents, nor does he have any children. Allah neither was born nor does he procreate. Therefore, for Christians to declare that Jesus is the Son of God is blasphemous in the mind of Muslims and condemned strongly in the Quran. Muslims understand, as stated in the Quran, that we believe that our God married, had sexual intercourse with his wife, and produced Jesus Christ, in other words, God's Son. Okay, so this is what is in the mind of every Muslim, that you believe this, that Allah has a wife, had intercourse with her and produced Jesus, and that's why we say he is the Son of God. Okay? Now you understand what they are thinking. Yeah, yeah. It's everything is on the natural. They are thinking in the physical realm. So let's look at some background. The Quran strongly emphasizes the oneness of God and condemns the belief that Jesus is the Son of God. Excuse me. <clears throat> so look at Surah 112, verses 1 through 4. Say, He is Allah, the one and only. Allah, the eternal, absolute, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. Now notice specifically how it says he is Allah, the one and only the one. Because of the idea that Muslims had of Christians that we believe in the Trinity, thinking we believe in three gods, so they are, in the Quran, it's very much emphasized Allah is one and by himself. He has no partners. And we're going to talk about that next week, about the Trinity. But you can understand now why Muslims believe that and think that. Okay? Because what I want you to do is now have an understanding that they are deceived, but they are, I have a compassion for them because they don't understand, they don't get it because they've been blinded. And there are also some other surahs I gave you there as well. So notice, he begetteth not, Okay, meaning he has no children, nor is he begotten, and he has no parents. Okay, so I would tell a Muslim, I believe the same thing. We as Christians do not believe that God has parents or has any physical children. 
Because that's what the Quran is telling you. I agree with you. So now they will, now you throw them off. Really? Okay, yes. But let's explain. Surah 9, verse 30. Look at what it says. The Jews call Uzair a son of Allah. And the Christians call Christ the son of Allah. That is a saying from their mouth. In this they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. Allah's curse be on them. How they are deluded away from the truth. So obviously in the mind of the Muslim and in the mind of the Quran, it is thinking of a physical sonship. A physical sonship, which we do not believe. Now let's look at what is our response as a Christian. Now this was so good that I took this from, uh, this is the, taken from Daniel Messiah. You may have been familiar with him. He, he wrote a book. It's from Open the Gates Ministries. He's down in San Diego. And this was from an article that he wrote. And this was really excellent. So, Son of God. Son of God is a metaphor that describes a unique relationship between two aspects, Father and Son, of God's single essence. Okay, now first of all, do you know, if you were to ask the average Christian, can you explain to me how is Jesus the Son of God? A lot of Christians, once again, would not be able to explain what does that mean? What does that mean? Because, you know, in the, be and in the beginning, I want to right away condemn the Muslim and think, of course we don't believe that. But what does it mean? <clears throat> we say it, and I grew up all my life, and I believe it, Jesus is the Son of God. It's all over the scriptures. But what does that mean? See, we take it for granted. But do we really understand this term and the origin and the meaning behind it? And that we can explain to somebody this is not a physical son, but a spiritual. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean even when I say that, spiritual sonship? What does that mean? Okay, well, look at this. A couple of things. The son of Egypt. Son of Egypt similarly means a man from Egypt. Not a man begotten from the marriage of Turkey and Iran. Okay? This is a term that is used throughout the Middle East. If somebody says he is a son of Egypt, they will understand, and you can ask a Muslim, if I say that this is a son of Egypt, what do I mean? Ask them, what do I mean by that, a son of Egypt? They're going to say, well, you mean that he, he, he's from Egypt. Right. He's a son of Egypt. I'm a son of America. You can say, I'm, I'm a son of Ontario. It means I'm from Ontario. My origin is from Ontario. But see, the Middle Eastern culture and the Jewish culture understood this. But see, we don't understand it in the West. Okay? <clears throat> and there are other terms. Another example, if a child is misbehaving, an Arabic speaker may say, you are a son of Satan, a son of the devil, okay? So I'll ask my Muslim friend, I'll say, so when you say that your child is a son of the devil, does that mean the devil has parents, okay? Does it mean that the devil got married and had your son? Well, no, that's foolishness. It's a metaphor, Okay, you're saying your son is behaving like the devil and he is acting like the devil. Okay, slowly you're going to start to put the picture together. Jesus is the son of God. He does the works of God. He's behaving like God. He is from God. Okay, so this is understandable when you, when you explain this just as I would say, a son of Egypt. <clears throat> Next, secondly, the Quran itself uses metaphorical language for Jesus, calling him a word from God. Okay, Jesus in the Quran is called a word from God or the word of God. Surah 3, verse 45, Behold, the angels said, O Mary, 
Allah giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and the hereafter, and of the company of those nearest to Allah. So when Jesus in the Quran is called a word, what does that mean? Is he literally a word? Was he a word walking around a word? Okay. No, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for who he was. He was the living word of God. God's expression on earth was Jesus. Okay. Just as in the Bible, Jesus is called the word made flesh. What is a word? When I speak, what is a word? A word is an expression of my mind, is an expression of my spirit. That is how I can express myself is through my words. So Jesus is the living expression of God the Father. He is the living expression in the flesh. But this is a metaphor. I want you to look at a couple verses in the Bible. Now, turning to the Bible. In John chapter 8, <clears throat> turn there. Because we have to explain to our Muslim friends what this really means. John chapter 8, verse 42. Okay, Jesus is having a discussion. He's having a dialogue with the Jews and with the Pharisees. And in verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. That's very important. Notice what it says. Jesus describes himself as proceeding forth. Okay? When we speak words, what is the word doing? When I speak and when you speak, it's proceeding from you. Jesus proceeded. See, Jesus was not created. This is a great, this is a perfect description of Jesus. He wasn't created. He proceeded. From God the Father. He came forth from God. And he said, I came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Notice what Jesus says, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a lie and the father of it. So this is very interesting. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. Wait a minute. Is Jesus, he just said that the Jews... So then no, they are sons of the devil who is their father. So the father must have a wife. So who is the devil married to? So now you're beginning to reason with the Muslim. Jesus says it. What does he mean? Does he really mean that they are the, the father? They are children of the devil? He's speaking metaphorically. Okay? He is saying that they are doing the acts of the devil and they are following the works and the beliefs and the doctrines of the devil. And they are living by the power of the devil. Okay? There's another verse that I want to show you. Give me a moment here. Oh, yes. John chapter 6. Jesus, throughout the whole New Testament, over and over again, refers to God as His Father, His Father, and He as the Son. But what we are trying to do, we are explaining to the Muslim that this is a spiritual sonship. And this is an explanation. This, this is how 
Jesus described his relationship with God as God being his father and him being the son of God. But look at, as Jesus was speaking to his disciples in John chapter 6, and notice in verse, uh, we can jump back to verse 56. Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Wow, whoa, Jesus, wait a minute. You're, you mean literally? As the living Father sent me, there he again, he speaks of God as his Father, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus, you're saying we're going to feed on you? This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. So you're saying I'm going to eat your flesh and drink your blood? And if I eat the bread which came from heaven, which is you, I'm going to live forever? These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in the Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, God bless you, many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Wow. Does this offend you? Because he knew that they were saying, this is hard to understand what you're saying. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Notice what he says. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirits, and they are life. You see, the words of Jesus, they were spirit. The meaning was spiritual. It was not fleshly. And the problem is when people understand Jesus from the point of flesh, they're going to make an error. They're going to mistake. Jesus was speaking from the point of spiritual. Eat me, drink from my blood, meaning believe and follow me with all your life and with all your heart. And when you follow me and obey my word, you will have life. Okay, just as when you eat and drink, you consume it and it becomes one with you. Okay, and so Jesus is speaking here using metaphor. Now, <clears throat> back to our notes, finishing off here. Thirdly, concerning the Son, the Son of God, the Arabic language has two words for son. There is Ibn, okay, it's spelled I-B-N in, in English, but it's the word Ibn, which can be used metaphorically, okay, and Weled, which is literal. Jesus is a son in the Ibn sense. Okay, so when you talk to a Muslim, you can tell them, that there are two words for son in Arabic. If you use the weled word, that is a physical sonship. But there is another word which is ibn, just like the Hebrew where you have the word ben, okay, because the Hebrew, and again, in Arabic have very similarities. You have um, like ben her, okay, ben this, ben that. Ben in Hebrew also means son of. So in Arabic, ibn can carry the sense of metaphorical. It is not physical. And Jesus is Ibn Allah, if you want to say it in Arabic. He is Ibn Allah, Ibn Allah not willed Allah. Okay? Walad. And the last thing to say here is the Quran affirms that God could have a son if desired. This is interesting. Once again, they probably don't know this. In Surah 39, verse 4, it says, Had Allah wished to take to Himself a son, He could have chosen whom He pleased out of those whom He doth create. Even though in Surah 6, 101, it appears contradictory. So here in this first Surah 39, 4, it says if, if Allah wanted, He could have a son. He could have taken a son and, and called Him His son. But in Surah 6, I'm going to read this to you. It seems contradictory, implying that it would be impossible for God to have a son. In verse 101, it says, The originator of the heavens and the earth, how could he have a son 
when he has no consort, he created everything and is aware of everything. So one verse says, he, if Allah wished to take to himself a son, he could have. But in Surah 6, 101, it says he wouldn't. It says he does not have. How could he have a son when he has no consort? Okay. So the Quran says these things and the Muslim needs to understand that Jesus is the son of God in the spiritual sense. And the son of, just as when we say a son of Egypt means somebody who originates in Egypt, so Jesus, the Son of God, means that He originated from heaven. He is God by nature. His nature is divine. And that's why He's called Son of God and Son of Man, because He's both God and man. And so the term Son of speaks of His origin and speaks of His nature. That's what it means. And it's not speaking of the physical. Okay? So hopefully that helped you. We went over two, two of the main objections that Muslims bring. And uh, we'll finish next week with another four. Okay? Um, briefly, any questions on these things here that we, we covered? Maybe five minutes, real brief. Any questions? Yes. I don't know if all of you heard her. She said, do we have to be knowledgeable about the Quran? First of all, um, it helps if you are. So basically, I would say if you take this course just with these notes and the references of the surahs, if you read those and you are familiar with them, you are, you are set. You have enough in order to share and to evangelize and to have a dialogue with a Muslim. Because... The majority of Christians do not know what is in here, okay? And even Muslims, a lot of them don't know what's here. But I would not say it's not necessary for you to sit down and read the Quran. It's, you can, and it, it might be helpful, but it's not necessary. But if you know these verses and you know what the Quran teaches here, you know what the Quran teaches there, you know what it says about this, these verses here that say Jesus doesn't ha uh, that God, Allah doesn't have a son, you know what the Muslim believes, but you're able to have a dialogue with them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yes. When they say the Bible's corrupted, and you nicely say, no, your Quran's corrupted, do they get... Angry? I don't say that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wouldn't answer like that. Yeah. So like I did... Well, normally I would, because I'm a guy and from the old school, but yeah, I know it'd be gentle, but I was just wondering if they would right away see it as, oh, you know... Yes. So, first of all, this is why, as a, scripture, as a scripture says, we need to know how to give a defense of the faith with meekness and with fear. So, even though sometimes I may want to say something, I have to hold back. And that's why you have to reason with them. So, I will go over these questions. Basically, what I gave you is really what I give them. So, I will many times say, well, who said that? Okay, leave, leave the burden of proof on them. Okay, the burden of proof is not on you. The word of God is unchanged. So put the burden of proof on them. Who told you? Okay, most of the time, you will, they will have to work through that. Who told you the Bible's changed? Well, the Quran says, where does the Quran say that? This young man for two hours, he could not tell me. He, he didn't know the surah. In fact, I will tell them. In fact, do you know the Quran says you are to go to the gospel and to the Torah and to the Zabur because those confirm. And if it's not in the Bible, the Bible, the Quran says you are to judge the Quran by the Bible. Did you know that? So they will say, oh, no. Okay, so you want to put the burden of proof on them, but you want to go through these questions. You know, how, why do you believe that the Bible has been changed? Do you believe God will allow his previous revelations to be corrupted? But the Bible says no one can change God's word. It says that he preserves it forever. So see, all of these things they don't know. 
And once again, no Christian ever tells them what the Bible says. You see, all they see is what's in the media. All they see. And what they've been told by their mosques and the imams. They have been taught the Bible is corrupted. You can throw it away. The Bible cannot be trusted. But the Quran doesn't even say that. But like I said, most Muslims do not read Arabic. So they don't read the Quran. They don't read the Quran. They don't know the Quran. They only come to mosque, like many Christians, come to church. They come, they listen, and they go the whole week until the next Friday. But they don't pick it up and read it. You know.